Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. We've all been affected by the coronavirus. It's been a short time, relatively speaking, only a couple of months. But it's introduced a little bit of chaos into everybody's life, whether it's the work that you do or your family life, the economics that you experience and, and have to deal with every day. And some people who are doing their job because they have to do their job. They can't stop it. They have to deal with stress in a different way. Take, for example, the first responders in Western New York. They can't stop. The Mercy Flight people, the firemen, the police, they have to keep going. Another example are the hospital workers, the nurses. They cannot stop doing their job because where would that leave everybody else? And in a situation like the coronavirus, it's all the more important for the health care workers to step up. Basically, they are the most important people now doing their job helping Western New York. I want to talk to one of those hometown heroes. And so I want to welcome Cassie Church, who's the chief nursing officer at Oshai Children's Hospital, to the show. Cassie, welcome to the big picture. Lots to talk about. Thank you about. very much. Well, yes. It's unusual circumstances, obviously for everyone, but nurses, they're like boots on the ground. They're, they're frontline people when it comes to this healthcare situation. Um, it, it's a new situation that's kind of uncharted territory. Nurses are normally under a lot of stress because just the nature of the job. How has that changed now in the last couple of months dealing with what they're dealing with? Well, I mean, it, it's fascinating. Nursing is a, a passion. It's not necessarily a career. Um, you know, people go into it, and yes, there's obviously a job, um, but people do it because they love it. And we all have an RN after our name here at Collider Health because we want to be here. We want to do what's right for our patients. And day to day, you know, we are, we are called on to help save the unsavable, witness miracles, hold hands at the time of death. So, as you said, it's an incredibly stressful job. Over the last two months, I will tell you that the resilience of our team has just shown through. I mean, the teamwork and the camaraderie and the willingness to step up to protect one another and care for one another has shown through. You know, we've had uh, employees who have immunocompromised conditions and they are very fearful for their own health, but feel as though they still have to be here to help. And another nurse will step in and say, you know what, I should take patient A, B, or C, so this individual can sort of be uh, my support person, but maybe not on the front line. So I think the resilience, the teamwork has really shown up. There's obviously a huge fear factor. One of the things that I think everybody is hearing about across the country is sort of this, you know, leading up to the event, there was pre-trauma PTSD that people were talking about. So we knew a trauma was coming our way. We know that something big is happening and all you can do is plan and prepare. And now that it's here, I will tell you that we have done our absolute best here at the healthcare system to put together um, hotlines and employee assistance programs to really help them unwind after the stress. But in general, I will tell you that the community of Buffalo, the community of nurses here have stepped up in a way that is just absolutely amazing to see. Well, you know, the stress is normal. I mean, we, we go through this all the time, the nurses do. Um, and like you say, you know, people step up in the hard times and they, and they basically kind of do the job, you know, and that's first responders of all kinds do that. And, and, and Buffalo in particular is a, is, a, is a place where people do chip in when things get tough. They do step up to the, to the challenge. And nurses normally deal with this job and, and, and they nor, normally... Uh, have that stress and they normally have a situation where they have to help out and there are a lot of different things that they have to deal with. This is a little di different because normally they can leave the job at the hospital. Now they have to be concerned that they may be taking it home to their families because their infection is, is kind of like a stealth disease. You can be infected and not have any symptoms. How, how does that affect everybody and, and are there precautions that they have to take? How do they deal with that? I think it affects everybody in different ways. Um, I personally have had a couple of nurses come up to me and explain that they have a higher risk person in their home and that they don't want to go home after a day in the emergency department. And I understand that. So 
um, through the Clyde Health Foundations and the COVID fund that we have, actually, we are able to um, help put staff up in different hotels around the city because of our partnerships with those, uh, you know, local businesses. We also, you know, here at Oshai, there's a couple of nurses that are sharing an Airbnb, um, which I think is just another sign of how they're helping one another be safe. Um, in general, as I'm sure most everybody there has heard, we've done a lot of antibody testing here. And here uh, at the Kaleida Health System, we are showing about a 4.7% of the people employed by us that were tested for antibodies are showing positive antibodies, which is a very low number. But what that means to us is that we're doing a really, really good job of protecting ourselves and ensuring that our teams have the right equipment and they're following the right precautions. Our focus right now is to not let putting on that PPE or personal protective equipment become routine. We do not want to get comfortable and lazy. We want to stay as diligent as we have been since our very first case because it's working. And that's really the message we're trying to drive home. Now, you know, working in hospitals, you're, you're working with, with viruses and illnesses all the time. Uh, and so, you know, and people know that, you know, you go to hospital, you're going to be surrounded with sick people. You know, nurses, yeah. uh, they work there. And so that 4.7% of infection rate that you just mentioned, how does that mm -hmm. compare with normal times? You know, mm -hmm. five months ago, if you were a nurse, what were your chances of coming down with some kind of an illness because of the people you were working with? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's an interesting question. So in our case, it's 4.7% of our employees have the antibodies, which means they've been exposed and their immune system has done something to fight it off. Um, how specific that is, everybody obviously is still digging through, and I will leave that to the research team here. Um, it, we don't actually track, say, during flu season, um, how many employees come down with the flu after caring for a patient with the flu, but the risk is always there. The PPE is always here. Um, this is obviously a little scarier since it's it's novel. It's new to us. It's new to the area. The symptoms that people are showing are, are new and unique, but I think there's a little bit more of a fear factor driving everybody here to do the right thing. Okay. And how long have you been into uh, nursing? So I've been in nursing nearly 13 years, but uh, prior to becoming a nurse, I actually worked uh, at a company called the Advisory Board Company that does um, sort of best practice evidence, almost like a think tank out of Washington, D.C. And um, it was with that group that I realized uh, if I was going to be in healthcare, I really needed to get my, my hands into healthcare. So I went back for a second degree and became a nurse. And I'm assuming that, that in all those years, you ha you've never seen anything like this, right? This is just totally uh, different. <laughs> This is totally different. I don't think I know a single person who can say they've seen anything like this. And um, in my short tenure as chief nursing officer here at Oshai Children's Hospital, we've seen the greatest RSV and flu surge in the pediatric population in 17 years and our first pandemic. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a day by day. Now, at Children's Hospital, what's the age range of patients that are seen there? Um, from infancy all the way up to age 21 from a provider perspective. Uh, every once in a while, there will be somebody here who's older than that because of a congenital disease. So we do see adults with uh, cystic fibrosis, congenital heart defect, and some of our epilepsy monitoring patients are older. And, and if you know, because uh, Kaleida has several uh, hospitals that, that they, uh, they, they operate, at Children's, because of the ages, because it's a younger uh, part of the population, is it, is it easier to deal with uh, these people or is it more difficult? I mean, how does that shake out? Is it, is it, uh, is it different at all? Uh, it's, I think it's very different because in general, COVID has not proven to be a pediatric illness. So we have actually seen very few here. Uh, which we're proud of because it means that we are still the absolute safest place for people to be, the safest place to have a baby. Um, but because children, you know, they heal very quickly and it's fascinating, but they also get sick really quickly. Um, so we are very aware of the ongoing discussion about the subsequent viral inflammatory diseases that are being seen around the world and in New York City. Um, we're keeping a very close eye on potential cases that we need to do sort of a retrospective look um, now that they've been discharged. But in general, I think our biggest concern would be those cases that go undetected. So we're doing our absolute best to look at every single symptom recommended by the CDC to ensure that we are 
double checking and triple checking everyone that we're looking into, including our pregnant mothers um, who may or may not have had an exposure, being obviously still kind of younger adults on the spectrum of who's at high risk. They're still fairly low, but uh, you know the birthing experience doesn't change if you're COVID positive. It just means we do a little additional work. In the end, when we get a vaccine for coronavirus, is it going to shake out as any different from a normal flu, or is it is it going to kind of blend into what we deal with all the time? Do you do you have any ideas about that? Uh, today, I would say we we should hope that maybe the vaccine can be a little bit more specific, but we don't actually know how this virus can mutate and change the way flu A and flu B do year to year. Um, what I can say is, you know, I've, I'm talking to my older sister with two small children and talking to my parents who are in a, a high risk age group and just talking to colleagues around the city and around the country is, we hope that this has taught everybody here what we mean when we put things out on social media that say, don't kiss the baby during cold and flu season. And hand hygiene really is, you know, the best way to protect ourselves. And in this case, really protecting ourselves from each other's respiratory secretions is huge, you know, piece of importance that I hope everybody takes from it. Um, you know, it's Nurses Week right now, and Florence Nightingale would have been 200 tomorrow. And, and you know, as the mother of professional nursing, if you will, she predicted 2020 would be the year of the profession. And we're calling it the year of the nurse. And I would say it's really the year of the frontline worker, the healthcare provider. But she was big on sanitation and hand hygiene. And if there's nothing else, um, that is what I hope people take from this. And in terms of the vaccine and what that means from an epidemiology standpoint, I will, I'll leave that to my colleagues at UP. Okay. And in your uh, experience and, and from what you've heard, wearing of masks, is that, uh, is that an effective way to help prevent the spread of, of the virus? It really is. Um, you know, the... If, if you've seen some of the diagrams floating around, um, you know, if you and I are both wearing a mask, basically our exposure to one another is considered non-existent. So if I was positive and you were negative, if we were wearing a mask to protect one another from, you know, the little droplets of spit that we don't see while we talk or a sneeze or a cough, it really is effective. Here at the hospital, we've been universally masking for about, uh, I wanna say six or seven weeks. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head. And in this case, we're using surgical grade masks. And so there's a filtering component on the inside and just kind of a nice cover component on the outside and two surgical masks equals zero exposure. And for people out there who have a, uh, uh, some kind of an illness or an injury or some kind of a medical problem, and they're a little bit frightened of going to the hospital because they, they think that uh, maybe they could be exposed and maybe they should just kind of play it cool and not go and just kind of sit on an injury or, or, or you know, deal with some kind of a sickness, uh, what would you say to them? I would say if you need us, please come. We are the safest place to be. Um, we are following every single guideline up to the minute based on DOH and CDC recommendations. And actually we have seen a lot of what you're talking about regarding people almost waiting too long because they're fearful to come in and by the time they get here, they're incredibly sick. Uh, and we don't want that. We want to be able to sort of stop your injury or illness at the appropriate time. Um, if you have a primary care physician, obviously call for directions. Um, all of our clinics are doing both telehealth and in-person visits, sort of depending on what the need might be. So using primary care is always a great first stop. But if you need an emergency room, if you are having symptoms of a heart attack, if you're having symptoms of a stroke, if you're in labor, um, if your child is injured, you know, any of those things come to us. We will keep you safe. We are following all of those guidelines. And because a lot of people are not being exposed to one another in the traditional office and school and daycare settings, I will tell you our emergency department volumes have actually been very low. So the likelihood of even being in a waiting room is slim to none at this point. We're able to almost directly room or bring somebody right back to see a physician almost immediately right now. Okay. Well, you know, that's all the time we have on this segment. So, Cassie, I want you to stand by because we're going to come back. We still have a lot to talk about. And everybody, don't, don't go away because there is interesting information coming up with, with Cassie Church, who's the Chief Nursing Officer for Oshai Children's Hospital. We'll be right back after this.